um, an anthropology PhD student at the University of Witwatersrand. She's the 2021 winner of the African Thesis Award from, oh, what is that? from um, the African Center Study in Leiden, and her current research focuses on the social history of El Dorado Park um, as a discursive space for reimagining race and the human in South African context. Tamir will be presenting her work today. Um, she's going to present for the first 15 minutes. And then we'll do a round of question and answers. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. I think um, Sapna is strugg struggling uh, in, with her connection, perhaps in the context of load shedding, um, but she will rejoin us. Um, but I think she was about to give away, uh, give the opportunity for Tamia to share her paper uh, that she's prepared. And um, I think you'd have had a chance to look through the paper um, that was circulated. Um, so this presentation, Tamia will just give us an overview of the paper. Uh, and then thereafter, we'll have an opportunity to engage in a discussion on the paper. So, uh, Tami, if you're ready, um, you can start sharing your slides and then we'll just take us through your paper. Okay, um, just bear with me for a second while I share my screen with you all. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tamia Boetis and I'm a PhD student at the WITS Anthropology Department. And it is such an honor to present my paper in this space, especially considering the role that the History Workshop has and its members have played in making this research uh, possible. Um, so today I present to you my co-authored paper Creolizing Forms of Commoning and Care, Black Midwives in El Dorado Park, Johannesburg. Um, the paper is primarily based off my MA research report, but has since evolved through collaborative thinking between myself and my supervisor, Dimitri Erasmus. And to give you a brief background about what my um, MA thesis was, oops, MA thesis was about, um, it was titled, Where Have the Midwives Gone? Everyday Histories of Foot Fidawa in Johannesburg, um, which detailed just that, the lives, the experiences, and the everyday histories of 11 foot fidawa, or Black autonomous midwives in Johannesburg, more specifically in El Dorado Park, against a question I ask, um, where have the midwives gone? In light of Harriet Deacon's argument that black autonomous midwives have disappeared from the, pu from the public archive from 1865 onwards. Um, and before we begin, I would like to read an excerpt from my thesis that unfortunately did not make it into the paper yet, but I think it draws out the themes really well, and you'll see it on screen, and it reads, the block of flats in El Dorado Park rise in monotonous similarity from patches of green soggy land that separate them from standalone houses. Rows of trash border the identical buildings. Their main entrances are indistinguishable. They are traces of apartheid's racialized sub-economic housing in which residents are left to create some measure of functionality. The drainage system is held together by an old clover milk bottle fashioned into a pipe that is crudely attached with wire. Each block of flats carve a trail of its own, much like the people that live in it. With feet sunken into one such sandy trail, I follow the pathway to Aunt Rose's ground floor unit of a three-story building. Like the main entrances, each unit is fitted with an identical door. Behind the front um, door adorned with Christian symbol, with the Christian symbol of the cross is the home of Aunt Rose. 
She sat perched up on a red velvet couch, a common item of furniture in working class households. And I think to myself as I look at them, Yena, weer die rispanke gemaak, hulle het moest klomp geld uit colored families tydens die 70s and 80s verdien because I have never been to a colored household who did not own a set. And just by looking at them, I feel my spine contorting to find some element of comfort on them, much as I did on others as a child. So this excerpt grounds the core themes of this paper, namely the idea of coloredness, dispossession, dislocation, relocation, apartheid geographies, and creolization. To give some um, historical context, our story geographically starts in Cliptown. And Cliptown is situated 25 kilometers from the center of Johannesburg. And it emerged in the late 19th century from the detritus of colonial attempts at racial segregation in this rapidly growing and early industrial gold mining city. In 1904, the pneumonic plague struck locations in present day Pageview, heightening fear of contagion was spread, which is very much underpinned by growing racialization. So modeled on the late Victorian social sanitary engineering, the response to this outbreak comes in the form of slum clearance policies. Consequent, consequently, these locations are condemned as insanitary and it's more than 3,000 inhabitants were forcibly removed to Clipsbrake Farm, put in tents in racially segregated camps, and um, the locations in which they were removed from were burnt down. Not more than 60 years later, Malcolm Lupton details the housing crisis that the city faced, especially for people designated quote unquote colored. So in turn, provis provisions for colored housing in Johannesburg assumed top priority at a local state level. And a working class um, suburb was designed, built and managed as a colored zone under the Group Areas Act. The development of El Dorado Park commenced in 1963. So when Cliptown then came under the management of the Community Development Board, their tenure was known for periodic shack and slum clearances, leaving residents with no option but to move to El Dorado Park. And thus families were forced into cubicle-like flats and sub-economic houses enclosed by apartheid geographic rules in the said quote-unquote colored zone. And this was my initial point of departure for a very long time, understanding how coloredness is reinvented, reshaped, reimagined in its expressions over time by using assumed very tangible markers um, such as practices of care or foot frower. But upon actually entering the field, the picture then starts to look a lot different than what I had initially assumed or conceptualized. So the paper goes into great ethnographic details, specifically about Heis Hospitala or house hospitals set up by Foot Froa. Um, it goes into detail about emergency home deliveries, a system of gifting, placental rituals, and postnatal rituals. Um, it's based off of a chapter in my larger thesis where Foot Froa detail the different processes and phases of birth and delivery. Um, it begins at delivery for, um, yeah, it begins at delivery, uh, which for some women occurred in their own constructed house hospital in their homes or at the homes of others. I think this was a very interesting point in my um, research. One of my participants, um, her gran had a house in Farafle in Cliptown, which um, acted as both a house and a house hospital. So you would have seen in the paper that you would have women in and out of this house hospital just waiting for babies to be born um, and they would stay there for months on end. But aside from house hospital, there were also instances where foot thrower were whisked away at early hours of the moon of at early hours of the morning for emergency deliveries. One of the foot thrower Omaivet 
speaks about how she was um, called from outside of her house at three o'clock in the morning, um, told to get dressed and get her her equipment ready or whatever kriya and medicine she needed. And she was taken on a bike or a bicycle um, across El Dorado Park uh, to deliver um, an emerge for an emergency uh, birth. Um, and both emergency home deliveries and Hayes Hospitala were done at little to no cost. Um, and then the, the paper then details the events um, that come after birth, such as the expulsion and the significance of the afterbirth of the placenta. And it goes into detailing placental rituals and postnatal uh, rituals. But um, for the sake of time, I use an example towards the very end to encapsulate the point that I'm trying to make in the paper. So during labor, the placenta or the afterbirth is to be expelled. Um, and most foot thrower detail the scene of how an old uh, glass rounded clover bottle was used for the mother to blow in. Um, and in my interview, one of the foot thrower, Auntie Laurel, uh, gestured at the size of the clover bottle and with her hands and explained how after the mother had just given birth and it was time to expel the afterbirth, um, she would generally not have strength to do so. So they were given an old clover bottle to blow into, um, I'm assuming to create pressure to expel the afterbirth thereafter. Um, and this was known and shared in various forms. One of my participants, Auntie Lola, um, expressed how on her first um, emergency delivery, she instinctually um, or received a sign from God that in fact she should be giving this woman um, a clover bottle to blow into as well to expel the afterbirth. Um, and they noted that this was done again because it was the only thing that they had on hand um, and because the mother lacked strength to push uh, the afterbirth. So relying on the clover bottle then assisted in delivering such. So what I find interesting is that this very crude and almost leftover item, um, this very crude and almost leftover item. Sorry, I've lost my place. Um, yeah, okay, sorry, sorry, I'm so sorry. Found my place again. Yes, the very crude and almost leftover item played such an essential role in birthing. So the clover bottle as a means to expel the afterbirth, I think paints a very beautiful picture of the, of the main argument that I'm trying to make. So what once then was an already consumed product seen by others as little more than just waste is given value in a particular moment and location that eventually then trickles down in time and finds itself a very vital member in complex postnatal processes shared by foot thrower. And it serves then as a manifestation of invention and re-engineering. So the used clover bottle was born out of leftoverness and waste, but was remade and repurposed as quote unquote, something else, much like the people and the foot flower in El Dorado Park as well. So again, what is understood then as leftover space for leftover people um, housed really beautiful spaces of commoning and of commoning of care where women drawn together and produced by very violent processes of modernity and colonialism as expressed historically in medical practice enact what I call creolizing commons or a bricolage of unknown elsewheres. So lines, knots and bundles of different histories to form this idea of something else or what I call a mingelmus or a mixture which to me is incredibly significant in my own thinking. Um, because what 
I at least saw was an imbrication of the process of processes of absorption, partnering, domination, disillusion, and cultural borrowing among social formations marked by changing power relations um, and by changing historical conditions, creating what Dimitri Erasmus calls a meshwork of multiple, mostly unknown elsewheres. And these elsewheres are historic, geographic, religious, cultural, and epistemic elsewheres and not homogenous notions of coloredness. So the ethnographic data that emerges does not fit then within homogenous or even contemporary understandings of coloredness. In fact, it then actually pushes against that, but rather it formed its own ambiguous, unstable picture of something else. Um, and in this way, the very dynamic histories and experiences of foot thrower have unsettled what Sylvia Winter calls our inner eyes, or at least my inner eyes, or my dominant ways of knowing and seeing um, colored people or, or a uh, place historically classified colored. And by using creolization then um, as a very important conceptual tool alongside the everyday histories of foot thrower, um, it allows me then to step off of the watchtower of racial categories. Um, and I come to understand this, what I call something else or what Dimitri Erasmus calls something else as again, a mingleness of the legacy and effects of classification and politics. Um, and I would like to emphasize that this paper uh, emphasizes understanding life then, not by racial categories, but because and despite racial categories. Um, I know that the paper at its current state has a whole lot of what my friends and I like to call ilachis or peppercorns. Um, it really is right now a clean babaki. It's a small little paper at its very early stages. And I would really, really appreciate um, the feedback from the session, but I thank you all so much for engaging with the paper, um, reading it and taking the time to listen to me today. This research means a whole lot to me. Um, and again, just presenting here means a whole lot to me. My research of practices of care of, in El Dorado Park has come with me since my honors year throughout the history workshop. So this was a great pleasure and I thank you all. Thank you for that, Tania. Sorry, I, can everyone hear me? I dropped out earlier. Okay. Um, thank you for that wonderful presentation. I think it was great. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions. Um, you can comment in the chat or um, you can raise your hands and I'll call on you. So we'll do a round of three questions and Tania will do uh, answers and we'll do three rounds like that. Yeah, hi, Sapna. Um, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, hi to me. Yeah, thanks for that very interesting paper. I have a number of questions um, I'm thinking of, but I just wanted to ask you a, a more kind of straightforward question. If you could perhaps uh, say something about the origins of, of the practice, um, the foot for uh, all the kind of history, how, how that idea that this kind of um, midwife and the community emerges and perhaps uh, link that to uh, let's say the alternative uh, conventional system you know the kind of the hospital care um, how, how prevalent um, is the search for the foot floor instead of perhaps going to a hospital just curious about if you could um, talk about that a bit can i address that sapna uh, yeah, let's address that and we'll do around afterwards. Okay. Um, I hope that I'm understanding your question correctly. Um, I suppose the history of food flower, I, you know, if 
I, I suppose, okay, so when, when I initially conceptualized my thesis, I think um, one of the points that we wanted to draw out was that um, this, what, what was initially happening, because it was incredibly difficult to find participants, um, because initially the, the paper, the research report should have been on food flow in Johannesburg, but I could really only find participants in El Dorado Park. Um, and out of that comes my conceptualization of an organic dying out of food flower, um, because what has happened over time is, and you see this in my, my interviews as well, is that people grow distrustful of food flow, but also they have, um, things are a lot more available. So um, in the time that these food flow grew up, the only real maternal hospital was um, the, um, the Bridgman. Um, and after that, then Baraguana Hospital, um, but, and, you know, a lot of people explained to me that, um, in fact, it was incredibly difficult then to get maternal care. Um, just taking, just getting transport to go to a maternal hospital was difficult. So at the time of them growing up and practicing, during roughly around, I would, I want to say between the the 40s up until the 70s, specifically with the Hayes Hospital, maternal care or state maternal care was incredibly scarce. So women in their communities trusted food thrower um, to provide care for them. But I think as time has passed and healthcare has become a lot more accessible for people of color, especially stuff like medical aid, one sees people visiting food thrower less and less and less. Um, and we initially conceptualized this as an organic dying out, but in fact, it's not. Um, food thrower have always been at the center of, um, you know, violent uh, medical, or their practice has always been eroded by violent medical practice. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. I, I hope I, I understood your question um, well, Njoku. Um, and Joe was just dropped out, but I think that was a good answer. Thank you very much for that. Um, is there any other questions we have? Um, okay, Noor, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. I was just trying to unmute. Uh, thanks, Tamiya. This is wonderful. Um, I, I want to follow up on uh, Njoga's question and your response uh, and just ask you to speak uh, briefly to two or three other issues. Um, and, and, I've, and I've previously asked you this, um, and I, I, so it, it's, it's the, the question is about the, um, the extent to which the practices uh, that you focus on uh, were uh, present in other areas. Uh, you know, El Dorado Park is adjacent to Soweto. You know, Clip Town is a sort of that, you know, Soweto, and, uh, you know, it also has a, 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 a different identity. Um, and so I suppose the, the, the question there is, you know, is this peculiar to uh, El Dorado Park? I'm sure it isn't. Uh, and, uh, you know, does it tell us something about, about uh, coloredness? Or does it tell us something about uh, poor black communities um, in general? Um, and, and if so, you know, what is that? And secondly, I think that uh, you, you've done exceptionally well in placing the, the idea of practices of care, you know, at the center of your, uh, of your research and your analysis in this paper. Um, and what one sees uh, in the present is arguably a destruction of various practices of care for you know, multiple reasons. And so I'm wondering, you know, in the work that, that the historical work that you, that you undertook for this, whether there were other practices of care that may have endured uh, beyond uh, the subject of your focus, particularly in the way that uh, women uh, have had to recalibrate, renegotiate their particular role in caring in poor communities. Um, so you speak about how, and I'd like you to elaborate on this as well, how the violence of 
perhaps modern medicine, you didn't say this, but I'm, and if I'm putting words in your mouth incorrectly, then say so, uh, the violence of modern medicine in uh, undermining, you know, food thrower. Uh, but I'm wondering what, what other practices of care have evolved, have existed and evolved, and may still endure uh, even when this particular practice uh, has faded over time. Thanks. Mia, do you want to go ahead and answer that? We will do the next round afterwards. Thank you um, for your questions and your comments, Noah. It's very great to hear from you. And yes, we I think you and I have been having this particular discussion from the very beginnings of this paper. Um, because this is this is not particular to elders. It's not particular to coloredness either. Um, and I think I went in with the assumption or at least looking for that in order to give, um, to breathe life into refuting the claims that um, colored people are quote unquote cultureless. Um, and instead then what you see is an array of different practices employed by different food thrower with different backgrounds. So there isn't necessarily an, an agreement upon this is what you do in this particular case. And these are the kraya or the herbs that you use in this particular case. And it varies from food thrower to food thrower to food thrower. Um, and that's why it's very difficult to, to create a very stable picture of what the practice as a group of women in El Dorado Park look like. Um, instead, you have something that's very disjointed, so something that's very unstable, ambiguous, contradict each other at different times. Um, and I suppose that is why creolization for me is so important here as a conceptual tool in understanding then how practices are born not out of a constructed and shared symbolic order, um, but rather out of practices of having to culturally borrow from this or practices of invention um, and so on and so forth. So I, I unfortunately did, I was not able to uh, look at the surrounding areas. I think that would have included a very nice and richer element to it, but because of the um, pandemic at the time, interviews already were so incredibly difficult. I, I only did telephonic interviews, which limited me then to a circle of women that um, I had already known or that known of, or that was known of by other people. So I was not able to sort of venture outside of El Dorado Park um, into Soweto to see if those practices exist there as well. But I think uh, the point that I really want to drive home is that it is not particular to El Dorado Park, probably. Um, and it's not particular to coloredness either. Um, but instead, what we see then is um, the taking of, of, of things or the taking of practices, um, the borrowing of practices from different culture or the processes of absorption and um, negotiation and renegotiation and invention and reinvention um, that create this very unstable picture that doesn't necessarily look like what we would and or what we would see in dominant indigenous knowledge um, systems discourse. So I think, yeah, I hope I've answered your question. Yeah. And then um, various practices that have endured. Um, I think I would have to revisit my thesis for this, and I think it would be great to sort of add it in. But yes, you do. You do see um, various practices that have sort of lasted throughout time, but you also see practices that have had to change throughout time because of the commodification of certain things, especially like linens. Um, linens as a medicine, which is the red and yellow bottle um, with the little Dutch man on the front of it. It's commonly sold in the traditional medicine section at clicks um, or whichever pharmacy you may go to. They have discontinued certain brands. They've also changed certain formulas. So what then happens is um, different recipes have then changed over time for different things, but a lot of them have also stayed the same. So a lot of them are also very tried and tested. Um, another section to my thesis, which I have not included in this paper, is that you have Kreya gardens as well. And I suppose the actual grounding of these herbs then ground the practices in which they find themselves uh, a part of in recipes as well. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. We 
we have a question in the comments and Noor is giving us a thumbs up. So I think you have answered this question. Um, we have a, a question from Zikona. Um, say great presentation. They had the question. They were wondering if the practices that midwife practice are rituals in some way, because they can be rituals in any birth story, depending on race or tribe, for instance. They're also hearing the importance of history here. And um, sorry, I'm trying. I was wondering if you did, when you did your ethnographic research, if you went through the archives and have the practices presently changed. And I was wondering, did COVID um, affect, impact any change that you saw in, in the research? Um, but okay, they've said that they, you've answered their question already. Um, we have any other questions? Sapna, can I just touch on a question sure. that Sikona yeah. has asked that I have not necessarily answered was the changing of um, practices based on COVID. Um, and Zikona, I think you and I have, we are actually yet to have a roundtable discussion on um, how the pandemic has changed cultural ritual. But I think if anything, what the pandemic has really brought out um, and really brought to the forefront are these commons that have existed throughout history. So in my analysis of the archive, you don't necessarily see foot for away in the archive. You see stories of midwives or quote unquote untrained midwives, yes, but you don't necessarily see um, official documentation on them other than them being unlicensed um, because of illegal practicing. But the point that I'm trying to get at is that what has existed throughout time, like Ace Hospitala that existed between the 40s and the 70s, are these very important spaces of commoning that exist within the bowels of power. And I think with different regime changes and different healthcare changes, what you see then is a continuity, in fact, of these commons. Um, so maybe not a cultural change, but cultural continuities that have always sort of existed throughout time, despite different regime changes. I hope that answers your question, Zikona. Um, we have a hand up, Luna. You can ask your question. Um, hi, um, I am Luna. I am a student development practitioner um, at the University of Cape Town, but I very much um, uh, um, um, uh, did some research at the postgrad level on, 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 you know, aspects of colored identity. Thank you so, so much for your contribution, Tamia. I do have a bit of a, a question. Um, um, and at, um, so I've always been interested in this thing of, of, of um, preservation and, and the, um, the, uh, so basically, the the question that I have, um, and I wrote it down because I don't always articulate myself so liquor, is um, are food for our and the and the narratives celebrated um, and preserved? And did your research um, have um, any sort of hope to to share and highlight these practices of care so that it becomes uh, um, sort of known in the in the public domain and you can take public domain as open to interpretation, not necessarily linked to research ethics? Um, because I think that these are um, um, like the the research that you found, or rather the the data that you collected, or the stories that 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 these aunties have told you are like vital oral histories, and uh, the food flowers practice of care um, can um, yeah the, the 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 practice of care as illustrated or practiced by the food flower. Uh, um, um, and your research actually is a great uh, contribution towards the the growth of African philosophy and the. Uh, ultimate rejection um, of the the power that comes with um, Western forms of medical care. Okay. Thanks, Tamia. Thank you, Luna. Um, so I think at a at a fieldwork level, a uh, common sentiment was that this was being lost. Um, and you know, they'll say stuff like these omaseratas. They'll say that um, young people or youth don't necessarily want to partake in the side of food flow that asked if I would like to learn <laughs> um, to really carry, carry this on. Um, but at a fieldwork level, at a grassroots level, um, there is really a push towards at least writing these Kraya recipes down um, in some form so that it is preserved. So there is a push towards that. But I think on a broader level, um, 
I think what's important here, and I, I again, I, I delve into this a little bit more in my thesis, is the difference between um, the public archive in in thinking about Harriet Deacon's argument, because you know she makes the argument in saying that the Black autonomous midwife has disappeared from the public archive, but I I make the argument in saying that in fact no. She may have disappeared from the public archive, but has very well been existing in the living archive. Um, so I think uh, in my broader thesis as well, a very important theme to explore is this idea of a living archive, building a living archive and and what it means then for um, communities. Um, yeah, I hope that has answered your question, Luna. It has. Thank you so, so much. Do we have any other questions, any other hands? So I have another question, but comment. Um, it's just a very interesting um, methodology for passing down knowledge. I think it's just something that is really interesting. Do you wanna, um, did you, when you were doing your work, were you able to record any of these recipes and world of food flora that you were, learning from willing to share their ideas and knowledge around that? Uh, to answer your question, Sapna, yes. Um, and again, maybe I should expand this paper to encompass a lot more in my thesis or at least break the thesis up. But there's a section specifically on Kriya and Kriya translates to herbs, um, but may also imply uh, an elixir of herbs. Um, and I have a table in my thesis of just Kriya recipes that were shared with me. Um, so Perhaps I should incorporate that somehow because it it again links to this idea of commons and an actual common commons in a in an actual garden where women still congregate. Um, you still have people that sort of, you know, pinch little herbs um, over the wall. Uh, and I had a very interesting encounter with one of my foot uh, Antifa Isa, who. Um, Methodology, methodologically, it was incredibly difficult to do this, but um, you had foot thrower that was just so welcoming. Uh, I would have telephonic interviews with her, but she, after, after I think my second last interview with her, she said, come to my house. If you are in El Dorado Park, come around. This is where I stay. I'm going to leave something out for you. And it was a little package of uh, Kraya mixture that she had brewed. Um, I think my only hesitation was that she didn't want to tell me what was what was in it, uh, but I think when you when you tasted it, you could deduce exactly if you're familiar with the kriya that she used, you could deduce what she used. Um, but yes, I do have I do have an entire table um, in my broader thesis that um, documents the recipes. Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting um, idea also like making a living archive because recipes really do um, speak to that. We have um, a question from Joe in the comments. I'm not sure you see it. Can you clarify how you're using the term curl, um, curl And if, uh, if so, how is it more useful to seeing the practices of midwives? Uh, thank you, Sapna, and thank you, Njogu, for your question. Um, I'm using creolization as a conceptual tool, um, and I only really use it after I have done all my fieldwork and sat down with the data in front of me. Um, and I think what comes out is that I was working from such a strange paradigm, um, using uh, you know, very common discourse on coloredness, both in the academic sphere or and in the non academic sphere as to exactly what coloredness is and how is it then that we can understand food flow and their practices of care as such or as a tangible marker of such in order to refute claims of um, culturelessness in colored communities. Um, but instead, then you you see data in front of you that makes absolutely no sense um, in tandem with what you were reading about what it what it means to be colored or this idea of coloredness and I think at some point in my research I sat down and I thought to myself wow race is so incredibly durable that it it, it permeates throughout research in such weird strange 
um, ways that almost blind you to very important um, important pieces of data. So I found myself thinking to my thinking, okay, what am I going to include? What am I not? What am I not going to include based on what I've read? Um, and I couldn't. Um, that would be completely inaccurate. And I think in conveying their, their stories, um, what was important then was um, using this idea of creolization as a conceptual tool in differently seeing or seeing otherwise um, coloredness or their practices, uh, rather not as this set that makes sense in terms of El Dorado Park as a historically colored place, but rather um, seeing it as this very broken up, unstable, unshared picture that is very important in um, unsettling the way in which we, we see dominant notions of coloredness, rather than to see um, these practices not not by race, but instead because of race, because of historical and medical violence. I hope that answers your question, um, Njogu. Yeah, thank you. It does. Um, we have a comment from Ali in the chat asking, can you also comment on your use of culture? Uh, Ali, can I ask for an elaboration of your question? I'm not entirely sure how to answer it. Uh, in your comment, can you hear me? In your comment, you are saying, you've, you've used the, the, the concept colored culture-less. So what I'm trying to understand is, what do you mean by culture? Um, and therefore that may explain how you arrive at saying there is an idea that a people are cultureless. Thank you uh, for your question, Ali. Um, I think this was this was something that I grappled with very early on in in the beginning phases of even just my my third year and honors research about, um, I think I think you know growing up in an age where you have to interact with people on Twitter that throw around words like culture and culturelessness, um, or especially in relation to colored people, that that's where my my initial interest lied, uh, laid lied, um, and I I was I was I wasn't entirely responsible with this term either, um, and I think it maybe I I need to think through it a little bit better, but I'd like to think that I've also sort of matured out of seeing ideas like culture and then in in um, sorry, and then ideas of culturelessness, I'd like to think that I've matured out of seeing them in, su in, in such mainstream um, terms. Uh, so, and really, and really backtrack to um, how I thought, um, you were muted there for a little bit. Yes, so we lost yeah, yeah, you. no, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure how long I was muted for, but I think the point that I'm getting at is, is, um, I, I need to think about the question just a little bit more to really think through how I thought about it um, initially and how I, I think about it now. Um, so I can't entirely give a, a solid answer to that, but I do thank you um, for a point that I, I do need to ponder on. Do we have any other questions or comments. Um, we have time for one more round. Hi, um, I do have a question or thought. Go ahead. I'm yeah. wondering, uh, in terms of the methodology that Tamir used, you mentioned um, using the living archive and also using telephonic interviews. Can you just explain how exactly those two things work and how you went about the living archive. I'm more interested in the living archive. Like what exactly does that entail? And did you get to, like for example, the descriptions of the living archive, did you get them through your telephonic interviews? Um, thank you. Thank you for your questions, Ikona. Um, yes, my, my methodology was mainly telephonic interviews, but 
Um, aside from that, I think, you know, after you do a telephonic interview, what you see is, is not very rich. It's not at all very thick. Um, so what I also did was I, I went around on walkabouts in the community. I initially used Google Maps and Google Street View to have a look at um, exactly where what the community looks like. I'm very familiar with the community, but really the more um, intimate parts of it in certain extensions. Uh, I also then got permission from Foot Thrower to get a broad idea of where they lived, just so I could have a look at where they stayed. And I, I literally walked through the community. I took a taxi from the very top of Turf Avenue all the way down um, through different extensions, um, and walked through the community to give my uh, field work, or at least the data that I, I got some, some richness and some thickness. Um, and I, I, again, I can't necessarily, I, I think that's a question that I would need to think about just a little bit more because I didn't really explore discourse on the living archive. It was just sort of a point that I made and that I'm gonna elaborate on in my upcoming research, uh, but to, to, to answer at least one part of your question, um, my data was gathered mainly through telephonic interviews, uh, contextually and um, descriptively, um, but walkabouts, Google Street View, spending a whole lot of time just walking around the community for context. Yeah. Thank you for that. We have one last comment. I think you can read it. I'm not sure if you want to go over it from Matthew. Um, you can go through it and let me know. Um, but thank you for your presentation. I think this was a great presentation. Everyone asked a lot of great questions and you um, discussed it really well. Um, yeah, it was a pleasure to have you to share your work. Um, yeah, and I think that's it for us. Um, you are more than welcome to chat um, afterwards and reach out to Mia if you're interested in her work. And please, and she's looking forward to all the feedback she can get to really make this baby paper um, a grown up and take out all those ilachis. Um, so thank you guys for attending and thank you for a great presentation.